Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench, we have an HP 8904A multifunction generator. So we have another function generator to add to the lab. I've been looking for one of these for a little while, but I've been looking for some special parameters in it. And the exact mix of parameters that I've been looking for doesn't pop up quite often. So there's a number of options for these units, and these units even had a very long run when it came to uh, their production. What does this cover in the lab that those don't? Well, the um, 8904A has some special tricks to it where it can, do, it can assist with FM alignments on RF tuners. I have a 8657 RF generator that sits up that way. And this can modulate that generator's output to give me the stereo FM that I need. Turns out when you want to do stereo FM, that's a fairly complex signal and kind of hard to come by. We'll take a look at that on the spectrum analyzer here in a little while. This unit has some presets if it's the right serial number and the right options with those two big asterisks. So the option that it needs is it needs the four channel option, uh, two channels, but it has a different, truly differential pair, which is rare because you can have high low with shielding on one channel. So I have diff shielded differential outputs and I have two of those. One of the other things that one of the options does is it adds four synthesizers to this unit and they can modulate channel one. So I can set three different styles of modulation, sum those all up, and then modulate channel one, which has a carrier coming out of it from DC to 600 kilohertz, which is incredibly useful. The other thing that this frequent or er, function generator, I don't keep wanting to say frequency counter, function generator does that is rare in function generators is I can float the outputs. So I can have the output ground reference, I can have the shield ground reference, or I could fully float it for um, depending on what my modulation setup needs to be. Not many function generators do that. I'm, I, I wish more did, but especially at the higher frequencies, but it is what we have. So on the back of this unit, which we'll get into serial number, this unit shipped with option one and option two. Those are hardware options. Now, option four actually brings the ports to the back of the unit. I'm kind of not a fan of those, but if you're going to pop this into a test rack and route them somewhere, option four might be useful, cleans up the front from the cabling. But option two, one or two, I can't remember which one, is the quad oscillator. Uh, so I can do the modulation, which includes actually pretty much anything that I can program. There's two other options in here, which is three and five. Five is a uh, fast skipping RAM with digital control out of the digital port. And I forget what three is. Those are software options. They can be added. This unit came with all of them already turned on. I don't know if they were upgraded later. But the important part is if you want the FM functions, you have to have serial 2948A or higher. There was some design differences in the modulation board. The uh, newer firmware will not go into the older units. You can still program the channels to do the FM modulation, sum them up, and have it as a program channel if you want. You just don't get the presets in the uh, firmware. But uh, 2948A with the easy way to tell is if it's the right options are 2948A, 4B and C's in the front. If there's only two, it can't do it. If it's under 2948A, you can get, you can do it. There's additional programming. So this unit does make the cut. Actually, it's pretty early production of the correct serial number. But what that gives you, we'll fire it up. Uh, given that it is very early production, we are going to take this apart, probably recap the power supply just for good measure, take a look at the insides, but we'll turn it on. I did buy it working. It did, it did function, but
But if we go down to FM stereo, actually, if I F1 it, uh, let me power it off, power it on. We'll take a look at the options first, I guess. Uh, shift and to get into preset. Uh, two, one, three, five. So we have all the options that you would want with one of these units. But if I go to F1 for channel config, channel A, channel B, C, and D, and then how they're routing, things like that. So this is programmed by the two-layer display on the front panel. It does go to some pretty low amplitudes. It starts at 140 microvolt, uh, and I can push up to 10 volts peak to peak out of it. So it's got some decent range on voltages where my RF signal generator kind of tops out at um, 1 volt peak to peak. So from the channel config menu, I'll zoom in here. If I hit next, if I don't hit F1 to go into channel config, but I hit next, we get some sequencing options that are good for working on radios. Tone sequencing, DTMF, which is, I believe, phone. Uh, this is capable of generating all the touch tone phones for um, old POTS service. Uh, we can digital sequence. We can hop the RAM. So you can really do some fast switching of waveforms by programming a RAM hopping sequence. And then the one that I was interested in was FM stereo. So if I go in here, you'll hear a couple of relays click. It's routing some signals internally. And we go here, and we have our base frequency, modulation, pilot frequency, amplitude, um, amplitude percentage, pilot frequency, and then some phase shifting. So lots of good carrier frequencies, pre-emphasis, pre lots of good F, FM modulation settings where it'll just automatically generate me the tone signals I need to modulate the RF unit. So we're going to have some fun stuff coming. I really struggled doing the FM alignment on the, um, the Harman Kardon. We did a Harman Kardon tuner. And uh, getting the FM stereo alignment, it'll be much nicer doing this. I may revisit that on a video, or I may just run it through the bench and get it all squared away. But uh, let's check the clocks and see what's going on. we got two frequency counters that are up and running. So let's see how well we're doing. All right, this is the very definition of overkill, using this frequency counter to check this clock. But now we are backed up by the rubidium. The frequency is going to drift a little bit in the beginning due to the fact that um, the fun uh, frequency counter is going to get, uh, it hasn't warmed up yet, so it is going to drift, I think, down a little bit is the way that one goes as the circuitry warms up. So we're going to give it some time, let it run through the, run through the process. So this is saying the time base in the function generator is running a bit fast which probably means the output is going to be a bit low, which is fine. This unit does have a very good internal clock on its own, but I do plan on hooking it up to the rubidium, so it's going to have a very stable clock source, probably much better than it needs for DC to 600 kilohertz, but it's what we got, so it's what we're going to use. Um, if you don't have a rubidium source in the lab, you could also hook it up to a uh, GPSDO and increase the stability, stability of the clock. From the service manual on the 7904, the clock stability of the function generator is the clock stability of the reference. Moving down to the 53131A, which we restored in a previous video, we're going to give it uh, amplitude, let's give it a volt and a sine wave, and we're asking for one kilohertz. So we will go, oh, it found it, one kilohertz. So the output is actually on. So we are running slightly slow, but this is 999.98. So at what point is good enough good enough? Uh, we have some dithering down here at the bottom end. We can increase the gate time to get some more accuracy here.
I'll go to five seconds. We'll slow it down, but we'll get a lot more digits out of it. So we're gonna run. We're gonna let the uh, frequency counters warm up, and we'll see where we're at after about an hour of warm up. So even though they're on a good time base, they still need to warm up their internal counters and circuits before they hit their peak accuracy. So on one of these counters, there tends to be two warm up times. There's warm up time with the time base from cold, and then there's warm up time for the unit itself. The Warm-up time for the unit itself is usually around 30 minutes. The warm-up time for the time base can be several hours to even, I've even seen two or three days. So uh, having them on the rubidium means we don't have a crazy warm-up time, but we still need to let them warm up a little bit. Okay, well, we drifted significantly down. Uh, we're down about 150 kilohertz because that was uh, 200, 10.2. Uh, we're now down at 10.50, so... Significant amount of difference between pre-warm-up and post-warm-up. With the drifting down, so what's probably happened is the frequency counter has drifted down while the function generator has drifted up, so they kind of merged in the middle. Because if we take a look at the other frequency counter, 9986, this has gone up a little bit, so we've got a little bit more stability. To exaggerate this a little bit, we will set the frequency to 1 100 kilohertz and that's going to bounce significantly higher now the other thing is because this unit tops out at 600 kilohertz actually I could just go to 600 kilohertz we are dividing down the clock stability so that's good because it makes it more accurate if I start with a 10 megahertz clock divide it down to 600 to 1 kilohertz we get a really accurate 1 kilohertz, even if the clock's off a little bit. Multiplying up, you actually multiply up the error. That's why the error is bigger here than it was at 1 kilohertz. So let's hook it up to the rubidium and see if that number changes. Okay, you guys watch the frequency counter and tell me what's going on. I'm going to pop this in here. Well, that changed a lot. So locking in a good stable reference really improves the time base. And we have, looking at the better frequency counter, 600 kilohertz, with a gate time of, I think I put five seconds on that one. It's going to dither down here a little bit. But I have three decades of nines and some dithering in the fourth decade of nines on one kilohertz. Uh, that's about as stable as I'm going to ask for. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> Sorry, just realize it's nine decades of nine, not three. So um, we are at stability to 10 to the negative ninth on a 600 kilohertz function generator, which is just fine. <laughs> okay, this comes apart like a clamshell, and as normal... HP equipment is very serviceable. The outputs are on the bottom. It does look like if you have an option four unit and you want to convert it to an option one unit or an option or a uh, non-option four unit, the BNC ports would be movable. They're just uh, on the outputs. These are the outputs for the two channels. So these would be the channel amplifiers down here at the bottom but there looks to be enough bnc cable here if you wanted to move them to the back of the unit or the front of the unit that would be doable without too much trouble some of the nice things we have going on down here not a lot of electrolytics on the boards very happy to see that tons of tantalum uh we have a poly cap down here nothing too crazy but no electrolytics which is fantastic to see we do have some electrolytics in the power supply that I would like to get out and replace. I've noticed this one looks like it might be starting to bulge. This is going to be in the front end of the chopper for the switching power supply. 
This would be the switching MOSFET. This is probably the switching transformer. And regulation is going to be done over here. Doesn't look like it's going to be too terrible to replace the uh, capacitors in the power supply. One thing to note on these units for viewers of my channel that live in a 240 volt section of the world, these line filters I have heard are popping on some of the people that are across the pond from me. So on a in a 240 volt section, I know these line filters are exploding. Uh, you may want to change that out as a preventative measure as well. No real electrolytic caps to worry about on the microprocessor side of the board. Uh, definitely some tantalum caps and some other things, but no electrolytics. I'm kind of curious what sink out and sink in are for. Not 100% sure, but uh, that might be a useful BNC to bring out to the back panel. Main crystal time base is, looks like to be right here. So a good time base, but not a crazy high quality time base. I'll definitely hook this up to the external. Um, doesn't look ovenized or anything like that, so we'll do that. This battery is a, of a mild concern. If I wanted to really, really future-proof this unit, I would replace the battery with a fresh one. This can sometimes, in some units, this can handle... I got 305, 305 volts on that battery. In some units, this will handle calibration... RAM. Uh, in this unit, I believe the calibration is with resistors and pots. There's a couple up here, a couple on the bottom side. But this will pro this is probably storing the digital content, so you can store waveforms, things like that, in the in the SRAMs. And uh, so this is backing up the SRAM when there's no power to the unit. Not a big problem, but uh, if it's Cal data, much bigger problem. If it's just normal SRAM parameters. Uh, I'm not going to have many that are going to be stored there, so that would not be a huge deal. So what's next would be to, I'm going to let this discharge for a while, then we'll get this power supply out, replace some caps. Um, doesn't look too bad a job. This is of the vintage where caps are starting to leak, but they're leaking discreetly underneath themselves. So I'm going to swap these out for good measure. Um, but we're uh, we're starting to get into that time period of where the capacitors were really starting to give some trouble. So to keep this going for the long run, we'll put a little bit of money into the power supply. Okay, I've got the power supply out and getting ready to start on the capacitor replacement. I'm going to, actually, if I have everything in stock, I'm gonna replace all of the electrolytics on this board and get it done. So just so you guys get an idea on what's gonna get replaced, We'll put a mark on each capacitor. Doesn't look too terrible a job. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve caps to do the whole thing. So it shouldn't take too long. We're just going to fire up the soldering irons and the desoldering tool, put on some music, and just wash, rinse, repeat. Knock it out. Okay, I'm about halfway through, not quite finished yet, and as I was going through, one of the things about this power supply that's a royal pain in the butt is the board's conformally coated on both sides. So I'm having to burn through the conform conformal coating, get to the underside of the board, and actually solder it. So that is slowing this process way down. Uh, I'm about this far into the power supply, so I have this much of it left to go. These caps have been replaced, and it's always a um, question, I guess, on the channel of how far do you go in a in a restoration and a recap and alignment things like that I mean realistically you could take the frame and put a hundred percent new components in there so when you do a restoration it's it's kind of a um, it's a it's a balancing act of getting the longevity that you need and not spending too much money over replacing components and as I got started in this power supply, I was kind of thinking, you know, is the recap necessary? Is it going? Is um, Am I overdoing it on this one? This is a modern piece of gear. And then I got hit with the fish smell. And anybody who has done a capacitor, uh, worked with capacitors for, for long, knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say a fish smell. These two caps down here, this cap, and this cap, 
all of them are leaking. Also, this one down here, I don't know if the camera's going to pick it up real well. I'll use this antenna to point. But I've already started getting trace damage on the board down here, so I had to clean that up really, really good. So even though these caps looked fine, even though the board was running, even though everything was good, I was starting to get electrolyte damage onto this power supply. So at this point, this is going to get a full recap, 100%, no questions asked, nothing's good anymore, and uh, it's going to get a fresh shot of capacitors, including these big guys up here. So that's where we're at. i got to finish up the job, but uh, um, the best way I can describe the smell is it's like cooking salmon on a stove. So if you've ever done salmon in an open pot, it really smells like that. Back to it and uh, get some more capacitors swapped out. Okay, so we are done swapping out the capacitors. I did not have snap caps in 270 volt, but I, or 270 microfarads, but I did have normal ones. The caps grew a lot because I used some uh, high hour caps and to get the same value I needed, uh, all I had in stock was um, some way higher voltages like the 35 volt 100 microfarad caps are 100 volt now, so they'll be fine. Um, definitely happy I got the uh, power supply done. That conformal coating was kind of a pain in the butt. This cap was red because it was a low ESR capacitor. That has been changed out with a low ESR capacitor, so shouldn't have a problem there. And I'm ready to hook it back up and see what happens. Hopefully there's no smoke. One thing to note while working on these is you definitely want to have these two screws connected before you apply power. That is actually how some of the ground gets transmitted into the chassis. So definitely want to have those hooked up. And let's give it a go, see what happens. I am going to hook it up to the monitored power supply due to being able to at least see what is going on. Well, it beeped, so that's good. Didn't mean to have it plugged in. But it looked like it started to power up, so let's move the camera. Okay, let's make sure there's no excitement. Well, that looks relatively healthy. I'm going to put the covers back on, let it get good and hot, and uh, just run it on a scope for a while and make sure it doesn't have any problems. Definitely needed to uh, do that given the fish smell from the electrolytic and clean up the board so we don't have a future problem where the board gets eaten. Here is the dish of shame. These are all the parts that we had to pull out and replace. But uh, that is done now, so everything looks good to go. Okay, we've set up a decent output. Moving over to the scope. We have a good sine wave, and I'm monitoring the frequency through the frequency counter. So we're just going to let this burn for a while. Uh, the unit's drawing about 35 watts, as seen up here. Says the displays. Correct me. I'm going to have to work on this unit. This is going to have some time at the bench. This section of the display is getting garbled every, every once in a while when I start the unit up. So something is not happy in my power analyzer. But all I have left to do is let it sit there and see if it acts up. Okay, after giving it a bunch of time to decide to play up, it never did. So everything is running fine. Draws a about 30-ish, 5 watts. If we turn the unit off, this one does not have a heated crystal, and we have a full-on power button, so we are drawing 0 watts when it is off. Thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at this 8904A multifunction th synthesizer. This is going to get added to the lab on our side so we can do some alignments in the future and especially some modulation of stereo FM. So keep a lookout for things to come. More is always on the way. As always, I'm in, I'm in the comments section in between videos and look forward to talking to everybody. Patreon page is running about four videos ahead. So if you'd like some additional content and want to support the channel, check it out over there. And I will see everyone in the next video.